Rick's going to read tomorrow's What's show for up, us. What, you think I can't read a prompter? You can. I better than any. Oh, I don't even know how long it's at. Mike Huckabee, Corey Lewandowski, Sebastian Gorka, and we're celebrating Father's Day. Yes. Don't miss it. We'll see you tomorrow. Like that? Well, You are looking live at the White House where the president is home, and if the numbers are right, he could be on a roll. In the middle of a trade tussle, a North Korean handshake tussle, and yesterday's incredible press tussle. You saw that? We examine why all of these tussles this week changed everything, and why Peter Stroke has some explaining to do, why the man some Republicans want to make their next speaker is demanding just that, because Jim Jordan is here and only here. And Kim Jong-un impressed? White House minority whip Steny Hoyer says the North Korean leader got everything he wanted, the U.S. not so much. Count Sean Spicer confused, very confused. The president's damned for canceling talks and then going ahead and having those talks and now talking about those talks after the talks. Really? Yeah, comments like these are really all the rage. He speaks and his people sit up at attention. I want my people to do the same. The president said he was joking, but don't tell that to all the press because everyone is still talking about whether he was too nice to this guy. So why not a word about how his administration just took out this guy? He's also a bad guy, a very bad guy. That you didn't know, thanks to a well-planned attack, this ruthless former Taliban leader is also something else, a dead guy. Good thing we're very much live, guys, because we thought we'd tell you about it, all about it. Not some of the news, all of the news. Yeah, I know it's Father's Day weekend. I could be at home relaxing and forgetting all of this lopsided coverage. But you know what? That would be wrong. That would be selfish. Relax. My kids understand. In fact, they're happy not to have me home. You're welcome, America. Cavuto Live starts now. I always love the nasty tweets we get before you even start. Get over yourself, Cavuto. And that was from my wife. Welcome, everyone. Really happy to have you. So after all the tussles, so many this past historic week, now come the tweets. Molly Hennenbauer got now with the very, very latest uh, from Washington. Molly. Hi, Neil. President Trump is praising his supporters today and also praising the nation's economic health or economic numbers. He said in a tweet, quote, my supporters are the strong, smartest, strongest, most hardworking and most loyal that we have seen in our country's history. It's a beautiful thing to watch as we win elections and gather support from all over the country. As we get stronger, so does our country. Best numbers ever. The president likely will be interested in what's coming up next week when his FBI director Christopher Wray and Justice Department Inspector General Michael Horowitz, who put out his report this week, will go before Congress and answer some questions. Congress, uh, members of Congress also would like to hear from that FBI agent and so many of the headlines, Peter Stroke. You remember him. He's one of the two married lovers at the FBI, Peter Stroke and Lisa Page, who told the Inspector General that they were texting on their work phones to keep their affair secret from their spouses. But now their messages are out out very publicly, and they're raising questions about President Obama's FBI and if it was working, in essence, to elect Hillary Clinton and to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president. There's this text from August before the election. Lisa Page says, Trump's not going to become president, right? Right? Stroke says, no, he's not. We'll stop it. And this one from a few days later, he's talking about somebody named Andy. It could be former FBI director Andrew McCabe, who was fired earlier this year. I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office, that there's no way he gets elected. But I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. Some Republicans in Congress say these messages need some explaining. What do you want to find out from Mr. Strzok? Well, first of all, uh, we have thousands of texts, conversations between he and Lisa Page that raise huge questions about what the meaning of those texts. Uh, for example, he says to Lisa Page, we're not going to let that happen with regard to, we're going to stop it with regard to the election of Donald Trump as president of the United States. Well, who is we? That's one big question, right? Uh, another question is, does that relate to the so-called insurance policy that he references in another text? There is a ton of information that we need from Mr. Strzok. We've been requesting him from the department for some time now. Uh, and and if he's not produced, we are now prepared to uh, issue a subpoena in short order. The Justice Department Inspector General referred five FBI employees for investigation after discovering what could be politically motivated messages. And we have this from the day after the presidential election. 
an FBI attorney number two, they're all numbered or given, they're not named, but it says, I'm numb. I can't stop crying. That makes me more sad. Like, what happened? You promised me this wouldn't happen. You promised. I'm so stressed about what I could have done differently. Don't stress. None of that mattered. The FBI's influence. I don't know. We broke the momentum. The current FBI director says the IG's report makes clear that the messages did not affect the agent's work. President Trump doesn't see it that way. What you'll really see is you'll see bias against me and millions and tens of millions of my followers. That is really a disgrace. And yet, if you, and yet, if you look at the FBI and you went in and you polled the FBI, the real FBI, those guys love me and I love them. I take this report very seriously and we accept its findings and recommendations. It's also important though to note what the Inspector General did not find. This report did not find any evidence of political bias or improper considerations actually impacting the investigation under review. The FBI report, uh, the, sorry, the IG report also calls former FBI Director James Comey's actions, quote, extraordinary and insubordinate in his handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation. Neil. Molly, thank you very, very much for a good report. By the way, as Molly was speaking there, we got another tweet from the president on this very matter saying that the IG report totally destroys James Comey and all of his minions, including the great lovers, Peter Sroka and Lisa Page, who started with this disgraceful witch hunt. And, and uh, I'm going on here to say, against so many innocent people, it will go down as a dark and dangerous period in American history. Let's get the read on all of this from attorney uh, Lisa Garber. We also have Nick uh, Fortuna, also an attorney. Uh, this last guy, I think you know, his face is fairly recognizable, Robert Ray, the former Whitewater special counsel, who seemed to have a knack for alienating both parties when he was investigating Bill Clinton. Delighted to have all. Robert, to you first, and all of this that comes out in the IG report, at the very least, it does reveal clumsy handling on the part of authorities from James Comey down. But more that comes up even through unnamed and unidentified parties, an inherent bias against the guy who wanted to be President of the United States, Donald Trump. What do you make of it? The president's right about that. I mean, it's not just inherent bias or implicit bias, I guess is the, the, the fashionable group of words today. The president's position, I think, has been vindicated, and that, you know, that's troubling. There's also, as you also you know, suggest, a colossal failure of leadership within the Obama Justice Department and the Obama administration. From the president on down, President Obama in October of 2015 on a 60 Minutes interview right. essentially said there was no there there. That had an effect spiraling downward through the Justice Department. Then you have Loretta Lynch making some, you know, really serious errors in judgment as the report also found the meeting with President Clinton, of course, was uh, a, a huge mistake, which she even herself acknowledged and felt at the time. And then from there on down, you've got the, the, um, the bias of, of everybody on the assumption that Hillary Clinton's going to win. It seems within the Justice Department, there was at least an implicit or if not an in, inherent bias in favor of trying to be protective of Secretary Clinton. And that affected judgment people stepped aside, didn't exercise the appropriate leadership and supervision. And it was left to, ironically, to Jim Comey to sort of kind of balance things out. And of course, he's the one who's then most subject for, uh, for criticism in all of this. And as a consequence, among other things, uh, loses his job. So, you know, look, it's a, if anything, it's a colossal mess, which is going, I think, to take, you know, a good long while for uh, the public's uh, restoration of public confidence and the integrity of the FBI. I think the president's also right to say, look, in the main, the FBI does a great job. This is not, while there's a, a, a colossal failure that has been identified, I don't think it's catastrophic. I think the FBI is well yeah, able to recover. There are more and more people within the FBI you come to discover, most unidentified in this report, who harbor some of these same views and, and Lisa maybe you can help me out with this but this this unidentified FBI worker who refers to Trump supporters as poor to middle class uneducated lazy I'll leave you to figure that word out uh, that he will magically grant them jobs for doing nothing and that prevailing view and there are others who are similarly characterized was it much more widespread than we're led to believe in the beginning that it was just these two 
starstruck lovers um, and, and maybe a couple of other malcontents, but it, it, there were quite a few more. There are so many issues to unpack with that question alone, and I think, you know, we're learning about the digital forensic investigation behind the actual illustration of these messages themselves and saying the FBI didn't have access to the right tools and only now we're seeing these messages between the lovers on Trump's campaign itself. Do you think any of this came to light, though, to, let's say, Bob Mueller before the text came to light? In other words, we were told once he got those two named individuals' texts, they were off the case, so to speak. The struck certainly was off the case. But how do we know that? How do we know that he wasn't aware of other biases among others? I would be shocked to find out that he wasn't aware of any sort of bias beforehand. And this isn't just indirect. It is direct, explicit bias. And the report itself, the IG report, is so reminiscent of Comey's own report on the laundry list right. of items that Clinton herself was really, it was so negative. And then the conclusion itself was, but still, no problem, no indictment. And in this IG report, the laundry list of all these text messages, which I'm sure everybody was well aware of, as an employer in any kind of company, you're able to see instant messages on the company server. And you get a pretty good idea where your people come from, Of course, come from, right? you better know. But, but let me get your sense of this right now. Um, I'm wondering whether it behooves the president to even consider getting interviewed by Bob Mueller or his team, or do they just say, as Rudy Giuliani was saying, you should even suspend this investigation, unlikely though that is. How does this change things? I think that it gave the president a lot of talking points, but there isn't as much substance to his allegations. I think, I think the American people could take some solace in the fact that the FBI did their job, you know, despite the personal bias. And the FBI did agents. its job, and he was insubordinate. You could argue in Comey's defense because justice wouldn't, right? Well, the justice abdicated their responsibility so to he, the FBI. So he showboated. He showboated. Uh, what he did wrong. You know, in, in this case, by publicly announcing the investigation and then reopening the investigation, the results of the investigation, then reopening the investigation 11 days later. You know, you could argue the, that hurt Hillary Clinton. Well, it, it, it essentially based on reports and polls, it cost her the election. So as far as any bias to Trump, I think it was counter counteracted by the You don't think they went light on this, right? Well, the, the conventional argument on this post is that it, they went light on, it, on, on Hillary Clinton when they when they had more than enough grounds to be much more aggressive. It's hard to say. I guess it's ultimately, you know, comes down to what your view is about the, the ability to prosecute in something less than what would ordinarily be considered mens rea or criminal intent. But for the now, president to, to say the whole thing proves his case, you say what? He's got, he's, he's got a fair argument. You know, it's, it's an important consideration. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I think that you, you look at this and you say to yourself, um, it, initially, the, the president's argument was unlikely to be true. And then when you go through this and you actually see the, te the blistering text messages, you say to yourself, well, all right, you know, Michael Horowitz may be right that they ultimately got the judgment call correct. But along the way, you know, no one expects that you check your political considerations completely at the door. On the other hand, using government property to have this sort of a conversation in the midst of an investigation in a high profile matter, you know, really, that, that, that just is outrageous. And, and the, pres and the president's order. right to say, you know what, that, that is not acceptable. When I try to put everything in context. Is to, it, it may be these guys, even the unidentified, we're talking about something was coming to light on Russia. I'm trying to get every bit of the doubt here. It still doesn't make sense. Yeah, the, you know, I would look at it a couple of ways. First of all, you have to separate out the poor judgment using the FBI devices to communicate between two lovers. I think they exercise extremely poor judgment. But as far as their personal opinions are concerned, everybody has an opinion, especially sure. in this particular election. Sure. It was extremely provocative. We haven't had a provocative candidate like Trump since George. But the danger here is they, they made a bet, though. They made a bet on the right. fact that Hillary was going to be elected. Well, elected president and, and, and it was a, and it was a poor bet and they spent more time worrying about or thinking but about what was, than actually right doing than actually so call me than, than actually doing their job everybody <laughs> thought Hillary Clinton and I'm not saying she should have or shouldn't have everybody thought she should have been president so it wasn't a poor decision it was Comey's actions that changed the result they were both terrible well, wait, candidates. That can be today. at least what I want to ask you is what was I was trying decision. to get a sense of is what was the the context for some of these Awful remarks about Donald Trump, besides the fact that they might not have liked him, could there, giving them the benefit of the doubt here, fair and balanced, could they have had 
information early on about this Russia stuff. And that's what they were referring to. It's a leap on my part, but I'm trying to, because th this is not the way I like my FBI no. agents and personnel to text or tweet or say anything. That's what I'm asking you, and, and whether that is a possibility and whether that feeds the argument that the president's wrong on this, that there is something here. Neil, I think that it is not a leap to say that these professionals involved would have seen information beforehand and that would have influenced these text messages. And the messages we're seeing as the public in this IG report and that we've been seeing in the past couple months only scratch the surface of what's been going on. And, and we mentioned that this is on government property. Can you imagine what's going on in personal email, although they're also using personal email to discuss government matters, which is a whole other issue. But think about that. Sirk was getting information yes. to help Mueller, uh, as was Comey later on. And they're leaking to the press. All they're, and this. they're leaking to the press. And I they're mean, having relationships with the press in which apparently some of them are receiving, uh, you know, bennies that they shouldn't be receiving. So flip it around real yes. fast, Including this tickets delays, to sporting events. Yes, this right, delays right. the Mueller report because he's got to be extra careful to make sure eyes are dotted, T's are crossed. It and means people have to work extra hard, and it's rather to be a lengthy report. But you know what? That, that that's that's a good thing. There needs to be it, some it sunlight here. Yeah. 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 These no, guys, do you think with these revelations this week, it delays the release of that report? It depends how thorough he's been up to this point. I, I really think that, uh, you know, from, from my perspective in the history of Bob Mueller, I think he's extremely professional. He's been quiet. He hasn't commented on this. He used to say that about us. Comey, you know. Exactly. And well, we now have the congressional... They used to say that about me. We now yeah. have... <laughs> if you saw Judge Pirro last night, she was right. speaking with the Florida congressional representatives who are now... And now we see Congress is going after all of right. these text messages, too. They, they're going after federal charges on obstruction of justice. This is going to play out over the next few weeks. And no matter how in-depth these investigations are, something better come to light quickly. Guys, I want to thank you all very, very much. A guy who will have a very, very big role in understanding where at least we go uh, investigatory-wise in this is a guy a lot of Republicans, by the way, want to make their next speaker. That's a separate issue for another day. With me now is a House Judiciary Committee member, Republican Congressman from Ohio, Jim Jordan. Um, Congressman, always good to see you. Uh, you too. A number of your colleagues are, are, you know, are chomping at the bit to to see Mr. Horowitz next week, Christopher yep. Ray, the FBI director, when he comes uh, to talk to, to folks. Uh, out and of Mr. Hor Rosenstein, he's going to be he's going to be in front of us in the next well, this few is weeks like as well. an Avengers movie. I, it, yeah. it gets better and better. <laughs> so what do you want to hear, first of all, out of the inspector general? Uh, it, well, a lot of you is a straight shooter came down the yeah. middle on all of this. Your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think there's a, some key questions like, number one, why is Peter Strzok still employed at the FBI? I mean, all the other major players are gone. Comey's been fired. Deputy Director McCabe fired, faces a criminal referral, lied three times under oath. Jim Baker, former general counsel, is gone, uh, was demoted before he left the FBI. Lisa Page was demoted. She's left the I, uh, FBI. Jim Rabicki, uh, Comey's chief, chief of staff, has also left the FBI. Why is Peter Strzok still there in light of what we learned from the IG's report? I think that's an important question for Mr. Ray and Mr. Rosenstein when they, uh, when they come in front of Congress. But have you got your hands on Strzok himself? And there, many of your colleagues want to subpoena him to, to, to testify. What would you want to hear of him? Of course, he has very disparaging views of then candidate Trump. Uh, we it's know that he was providing a lot of the research and early, you know, footwork for for Bob Mueller and, uh, since fire. No, you're right. But what do you what do you want to hear from him? He's the key player. He's the, he's the central figure throughout this entire narrative. Ran the Clinton investigation, was the lead investigator on the Russia investigation. He's the central character. And I think those sequence of, of uh, text messages are important. Remember, Peter Strzok opens the Russian investigation on July 31st. Eight days later, we have the text message that we saw in the report. We will stop Trump from being president. One week after that, we have the text message, August 15th, which says we need the insurance policy to make sure Trump isn't president. I'd want to walk through that sequence all the way up through September 2nd, where we have another text message from Mr. Strzok, where he says, POTUS, President Obama, POTUS wants to know everything we're doing. The operative word there is everything. So I would want to walk through that sequence. You opened it on the 31st and what happens in the next four and a half weeks in those text messages, I think tells a lot. We need to unpack that and get answers from Mr. Strzok when he comes in for his deposition. Still, there are a lot of Democrats who are seizing on this, uh, sort of saying that there's confusion and that Republicans are divided. There, you, you guys seem to be suing each other for documents, whether it's Rod Rosenstein, and, and now he, he will go the other way at you to simply push for the same thing. On that, uh, Republicans are, are, are eating themselves alive on this. What, no, what do you no, make no. of that? 
Well, let's be clear. Rod Rosenstein isn't giving us the material we're entitled to have as a separate and equal branch of government to do our constitutional duty of oversight. And in addition to not no, giving us the material. he's saying he has to do his constitutional duty and that Rod, what you're doing gets in the way of that. Rod Rosenstein's name was never on a ballot. He wasn't elected to anything. But the House of Representatives and the people in the United States Senate were. And we are a separate branch of government entitled to that information. So instead of fighting us all the time and instead of threatening members, excuse me, staff members on the Intelligence Committee, why don't you just give us the stuff we're entitled to see so we can figure out and get answers for the Do American people? Do you think people? the president should fire him? I think Rod Rosenstein is, is frankly skating on thin ice, and if he doesn't start giving us the information, I think you're going to see more things happen in the House. We filed a resolution last week, Mr. Meadows and I did, that says, uh, since of the Congress, if you don't give us this information, there's going to be a vote in the United States Congress. I think that will happen sometime soon. I'm hopeful it will. And then there's also contempt. There's also impeachment. But he needs to give us that information and quit threatening. I mean, think about that. The, the head of the Department of Justice threatening staff members in a separate branch of government trying to do their jobs, trying to get answers for the American people. And why is it, Neil, why is it the most explosive 50 some thousand text messages between Strzok and Page and the one we've not seen, the one we didn't see until this report was the most explosive one. We will stop Trump. That, that, that's un why, why didn't Rod Rosenstein show us that one earlier when we saw we saw the insurance policy text? We've saw all, seen the text with all the bias and animus towards President Trump. Why was it we just see this one on, on uh, two days ago when the report comes out? So those are some of the other questions we have for Mr. Rosenstein and Mr. Ray. Real quickly, the president said his, says this whole thing with the IG report vindicates him. Do you agree? I think it shows how the bias that existed at the top people, again, not the rank and file agents no, who are doing good work, asked, but the top people. He says it vindicates and it exonerates him. Do you agree with that? I think it shows that, that, that well, we know that we know there's been no evidence of any coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia. A year of this, of Mr. Okay. Mueller's investigation, no evidence. So this report, I think, buttresses that, that what, what we already know and shows the bias that existed. Even the, even the right. inspector general says we, we do have no confidence that Strzok's decision was free from bias. They even say that in their report. Congressman, thank you very, very much. A Democrats read on this after this. Actions were unfair to Hillary. No, I think that James Comey was unfair to the people of this country. All right, that's the president's view here. There are a number of Democrats that was come out and said, wait a minute here. Uh, we believe the whole Comey situation, he, he blocked our candidate from an easy pickup and an easy win in the presidential election. So we're the ones who were suffering from a bias here that hurt us politically. Uh, let's get the read on that front from former Democratic congressman, uh, former presidential candidate. Dennis Kucinich. Dennis, you think in the end, all this back and forth and insubordination on Comey's part cost Hillary Clinton the election. Is that right? Well, it's measurable, Neil, that states that were trending towards her in the last two weeks suddenly moved towards Donald Trump uh, in the last 10 days and in the last in the closing days of the election. And there's just no question that uh, Comey's announcement on October 28th to Congress that uh, the FBI has learned of uh, this new information regarding emails, uh, tilted the election. Now, keep in mind. But Dennis, I would even buy that if, if it was Hillary Clinton surging at the time. She was falling in polls in those states prior to this. Now, to your point, that might have sped it up a little bit, but she was deteriorating as a candidate connecting with the very voters that she took for granted were her base. Look, this doesn't take anything away from Donald Trump. Let's, let's set aside for a moment whether any of us were for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Let's go to the fact that the FBI on September 29th already had the information that was announced on October 28th. And as somebody who's running a lot of elections, I can tell you, the last 10 days of an election, if a new information surfaces, right. it can change people's views. So, yes, it did have a measurable outcome. And again, without taking anything away from Donald Trump's candidacy, this decision that Comey made to notify Congress on October 28th of information that he, you know, the FBI had possession of for a month uh, certainly had an impact on the election. And the other thing is uh, that, and you know, Jim Jordan spoke about this moments ago, the fact that you had FBI agents who were making political commentary back and forth. Lady Justice is supposed to be blindfolded, right? Well, in this case, that blindfold was off and there are people playing politics inside the FBI against Donald Trump. 
Bottom line, both political parties and, and the American people were deprived of a fair choice. And frankly, even now, we have to be skeptical of things that the FBI uh, did back then that are having an impact on an investigation that's ongoing at this moment. You know, there are, uh, from the president on down, there are a lot of people saying, well, maybe it is a rigged game. Maybe there is a cabal against him, or maybe there are more bad apples uh, the FBI than we thought, and maybe the problem started at the Justice Department, because one of the reasons James Comey gave for, for going rogue or getting insubordinate was because he wasn't getting much follow through from Loretta Lynch at the Justice Department all the way up to President Obama. Now, I don't know what the truth is, and you might be more attuned to this than I'll ever be, but I'm wondering whether that does say something in the wider sense that these agencies, all the way up to the Justice Department, were not keen on Donald Trump and were very keen on Hillary Clinton and would be more inclined just by human nature to help her and hurt him. Well, you know, that can all be true. But it's also true that Jim Comey's announcement on October 28th hurt Hillary Clinton. And whether he did it to help Donald Trump or not, I doubt it, but it hurt Hillary Clinton. And the fact of the matter is, the FBI, no one at the FBI should have their thumb on the scale of an election. That's not their job. And, you know, the fact that, I mean, you wonder why there's not some kind of a cooling off period that in the closing days of an election, stuff just isn't thrown out there and given an, an official stamp of approval by a justice well, agency. Well, then let me ask you, that. Just, people just, to look, hey. Because you're a straight out, you're very honest. I know where you come from politically, and, but you're clear. Do you think that Donald Trump legitimately was elected president of the United States? Yes, of course. Okay, so because, I, I, I got to tell you. I still talk to Democrats who just say, well, I don't know, or this, I don't, they're deliberately keeping out the specter that that was what created uh, Donald Trump to become the next president of the United States. It, that wait, that wait, it was so a wait, here's... Do you think the, those Democrats who seize on that and question his validity, do you think that is right? Look, he is the president of the United States he was elected by the people of the United States according to the system and according to laws. At the same time, did Jim Comey do something on October 28th that caused public confidence to be eroded in Hillary Clinton's candidacy? No question That's about it. That's not what I'm asking. They're going yeah, on but, the Russian but, but thing. They're going on the fact there. that the FBI went light on that, was, was, was tiptoeing on that. Justice was not aggressively following on that because they, they, they were sure that Hillary Clinton would win. And furthermore, anything that would show interference would only help Donald Trump. And that Democrats to this day, many in your own party, Dennis, to this day, are saying he is illegitimate. Is that right? What right. do you think of Democrats no, of course, who listen. still seize on that, that he's not a legitimate, duly elected president? Well, let's talk to Americans here, Democrats or Republicans. Donald Trump is our president. How he became president is still at issue. But he is the president of the United States. And the conduct of the FBI... You just did it there. Comey. How he became president is still an issue. It shouldn't be an issue. He was duly elected president. You're Look, putting an asterisk to it. The inspector general's report raises questions about what Comey did. And, and you have to look at the polls, Neil. They tilted the outcome. And I'm saying this without regard to whether somebody's for... For, uh, you have no proof Donald of that. Trump or Dennis, Clinton. you have no proof of that. Believe me, I don't care what over the president. I don't care what over earlier. I'm just telling you, you have no proof of that. And you are just you know, feeding I, a I've, narrative I've that says questions. he's not the real deal. He's not the real president. Now, that, now see, I he, he, look, he, let's go over it one more time. Donald Trump is the president of the United States. There's just, you know, why even argue that? The point is, though, that that election, the last 10 days of the election, some things happened that it absolutely changed the outcome. Now, she refused to go to the very states that Donald Trump surprisingly won. Absolutely, Wisconsin. He won. You could, she did You're right. He had you're the right. opportunity. She had the opportunity. He took advantage of it. You're 100% right. He is the right. president of the United take, States. It doesn't Done. take, the, the Inspector right. General's report doesn't take anything away from Donald all Trump's right. well, that's presidency, it. Just wanna, but it does raise put questions. Put it all together. He's the president. More after this. He's the president. <laughs> you
are sitting where you're sitting today. All right, you're looking live at uh, Kings Point, New York. Uh, that is Defense Secretary James Mattis, Mad Dog, uh, addressing graduates at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. They were very keen having him, um, especially for a guy of, of that status who still goes by the nickname Mad Dog. No one, no one, no one messes with that guy, and for good reason. All right. Uh, a couple of developments I want to follow up on here, the back and forth, the politics that's played, and we've got an inkling of it here on, on both sides on this ongoing investigation, how long it drags on, et cetera. But I do want to show you something that might give you an idea where Wall Street's coming from. I've often said on this show that uh, it's really not about the red or the blue to these guys. These guys are green. They love money, 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 money. And they loved it when Bill Clinton was president, last time I checked a Democratic uh, president, and they feared his impeachment and the possibility that he could go because he was very good for them, very good for the economy. So they rallied when it looked like uh, the Senate wasn't going to follow up on what the House wanted to do, and Bill Clinton survived that one. Well, you know the rest of the story. Enter what happened last Thursday uh, when we had this uh, New York Attorney General uh, focus and, and filing against the Trump family, more to the point, the Trump Foundation. When news of that broke about an hour and 15 minutes into trading, the market started tanking. Uh, they tried to recover, really, actually, on that day, never really did, on the fear that, well, this steady flow that they like, including tax cuts and regulation cuts, would be stymied or interrupted. And they don't like that, because what I say, they like money. So do these guys, uh, Jonas Max Ferris, Jessica Tarloff, and Charles Payne. Charles, that was a remarkable kind of an feeling on Thursday because you saw it in real time yeah and then it dissipated a little bit they focus on I think trade is obviously a big issue I'm not mitigating that but what do you make of that and, uh, we've seen this over and over again but what I think is really uh, starting to become crystal clear also is that Wall Street is beginning to believe that uh, all of these issues will not ultimately impact the presidency so while we did have that knee-jerk reaction because we're always going to get them until there's complete resolution uh, on that same day the Nasdaq closed at the high of the session very good the point. Russell 2000 thousand hit an all-time high and that that was also hurt because the dollar had its biggest move in two years but every single time we've seen negative news implying that there could be problems legal problems for the president you're right the immediate reaction is sell first and then try to gather the details later what do you make of that Jonas? I feel like I've been lied to a business school because by all <laughs> by all by any standard the market should have tanked this week I mean this whole this trade war thing which is building again we're getting China saying they're gonna add this should be bad for investors unless we're all wrong and Trump's going to win and the trade wars, he's going to be able to spin it as a win and China's going to back down and he's not going to have any chance of getting any real trouble over any of these recent things. Or investors are being delusional. I don't know which one it is, but the market says nothing bad's going to happen. So well, do you tax subscribe to that belief that if the market is saying it, the market's you know, right? The you market's adjust? right most of the more than people are most right. most of the time. But every the market's so often, comprised of people. It is, and it's it's the best bet, future betting mechanism. Except occasionally it gets a little too impressed with its own success, and you and ahead of it, so and it does. Yeah. It did it with it didn't ignore the real estate bubble too long. It ignored the tech boom in 2000. So right. it could be one of those moments where like it's all going to come to a crash whatever Cassandra but I think at this point nothing really bad is going to happen to the economy or the tax cuts that are in place because of all this news at least that's what investors are saying what do you think I agree with Jonas and I think you can actually see that in the refocus on the part of the Democrats onto health care away from the economy so health care is the issue that polls best for Democrats it's what they should be hammering over and over again Republicans are very weak on the health care issue um, so I think that but they're all over the map on this health care thing well, the polls are, uh, Obamacare is more popular than it's ever been. Obama himself is. If you look at key races, special elections that we've won and races um, in New Jersey, in Virginia, he the health care issue was the bellwether there. So when you look at the messaging out of Democrats, barring the crumbs and the, you know, $1,000, right. we, we don't talk about that that much, though I did just say it on national TV again. Uh, you see that in these races, people are looking at the health care issue, and I think that is reflective of what Jonas is talking about, that the market is going to continue to do well, consumer confidence is going to going to continue to grow and this president is getting credit for the economy so we shouldn't right. be hammering that for the midterms we should be focusing on issues that democrats are polling well on yeah. this morning in axios that's all they talk about too to your point that they have been grappling for an issue and, and wall street i don't think wall street is drunk on anything i think wall street is following the real data not the hype not the headlines but the real data that we were reminded of this week when retail sales came out so powerful what i loved about this retail sales report though is that the growth 
of department stores was faster than the internet, that the growth of restaurants was faster than groceries. What does that say? All that confidence that Jessica is talking about that we've seen in polls at soft data has come to fruition. People are leaving their homes. The hottest stocks well, in the market this week. Do they trust the president then and not with the fears of what the president might. no the market the market to jonas's point has a, the professional smart money the big money that can move markets uh it probably has has summed this up this Mueller investigation has taken a long time you know so uh, they don't see that going anywhere and they don't see the trade thing going anywhere. but it's an adjust right. that you don't know it's, they've learned to adjust to the known unknowns no, the Trump no, here, presidency it, has this here's every the thing week. with the trade thing guys We're, think about yesterday's session the dow rallied 200 points after china retaliated as soon as the China news hit, the market soared. You know why? Because we're getting closer to resolution. But Trump, getting closer to and resolving this it was a relatively tepid response, as right. was our, right. our initiative. And, and as a matter of fact, the $50 billion number was a misnomer because we didn't implement the key part, the Section 301, which is focused on China 2025. Right. That's where they want to dominate the world. We haven't even leveled those yet. We put out the categories. Okay. So it's part of a negotiation. Right. I'm just as happy that you didn't mention the dollar. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> He's a genius, is that? So well, what do you think, that net-net, maybe the markets are just going to trust the president on this one and hope we get through these hurdles? Let, let, let me just play devil's advocate and pretend the market is wrong. Because, Charles, you said the NASDAQ was high, which is true, and it's, the, the trade war should have started something. This thing with the Theranos stock, well, that's just a fraud. And it's just a wholesale fraud, that, and everybody lost billions of dollars. Right. And how that hasn't affected tech stock confidence and startup confidence is a little weird, I think. And it plays. It's, 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 well, just you don't know that, because I will say a lot of the new recent IPOs have been duds. You know, Snap went straight down. The whole, right. you know, so that whole unicorn thing, I think, is a different story as opposed to the economy. You can't deny what we're seeing in this economy. I don't know. When Webvan and Patch.com started good on the whole thing, it was like, we got, we got hosed here. And investors have so much confidence right. even something that scale but is just i know you guys come back later on but are your liberal friends getting worried that none of this is sticking none of the trade fears are sticking the Mueller thing isn't sticking and it's looking like dem democrats might not be part of a big blue wave in november no well the generic ballot our like, well, lead you is get together increasing. at starbucks so you're getting frantic or, i am going right after this actually are. i need my chai okay um no, they're not getting afraid of that. It, the generic ballot had actually shrunk down to about two, three points, and right. now it's back where you would so kind of want to say, well, the we house need is 23 flip. seats, and when you look yes at Yes or no, is the house going to flip? <laughs> you, I think that it is. That I'm scared about the that tone, Senate. The F-bomb of the Tonys right. didn't make you think we got nothing going. <laughs> All right, very, very, very We got good. nothing. No game. All right. Oh, we, I we forgot a little game. I don't know if this is good or bad, but they are going to be back. Uh, <laughs> and that gives Charles more opportunity to discuss global currencies. And that's one you want. That's a pay-per-view of that. All right. In the meantime, we got Oprah Winfrey and Nicole Kidman, not, not physically on this show, but they both made deals that raised my eyebrows and made me think, and this happens sometimes, I, I, I fall into a Charles mode. This could be portending something very big. I'll explain after this. All right, as you know, by now, AT&T can scoop up uh, Time Warner, and they will, and they're going through the formalities and meeting with people across all the various entertainment uh, issues that, that comprise Time Warner, or the like Time Warner. Uh, but, you know, a lot of other stocks are in play, including uh, the, the parent company here, uh, 21st Century Fox, and a host of other players. Susan Lee has been looking at all of that and joins us right now. Hey, Susan. Hey, good morning to you, Neil. Yeah, it's been a big, big week for media companies after AT&T won the right to buy Time Warner, Comcast, upping its bid to buy 21st Century Fox. So we saw multi-month highs for a lot of these names. Big rallies for the likes of Discovery, Lionsgate, CBS, AMC Networks, but the biggest winner of the weekend, arguably for the past year, 21st Century Fox, the owner and operator of this network, up for 11 days in a row, nine straight record closes, and the longest winning streak for the stock. Now, this all happened after the Department of Justice lost its case to block the AT&T merger with Time Warner, so the media merger floodgates have opened up big and wide, and as speculated, Comcast is now increasing its bid for the asset of 21st Century Fox that Fox had already agreed to sell to Disney for over $52 billion at the end of last year. Comcast now offering $65 billion all in cash. So you might be asking what's behind all this deal activity. Well, it's fear 
of big tech like Netflix, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, who have taken viewers away from traditional television and really threatens to dominate the future of entertainment. This is making traditional media companies feel the need to spend in order to stay relevant. Now, Silicon Valley giants, they can, by the way, still step into this buying spree. They certainly have a lot of cash to do it, half a trillion dollars just sitting on the sidelines. But instead of buying networks or movie studios, big tech has really shown a preference instead to pay to pay up for famous talent to create original content for their own platforms and a great example of that Apple just announced yesterday they have signed a deal with Oprah Winfrey to create original programs for Apple's planned subscription-based video service and not to be outdone by Apple of course Amazon also inking a similar first look deal with Nicole Kidman so as you see Neil it's an, a media arms race and you have to spend just to stay in the game back to you all right, um, it's just a matter of time before these guys want bond market experts. I have to <laughs> All right, thank you, Susan. She'll be back in the next hour. Also, uh, we're getting a couple of interesting vibes on the press right now. Um, you, you know, a lot of people thought that after Sean Spicer left as press secretary, uh, they would calm down, wouldn't be as rambunctious. Of course, that didn't happen. So we always wondered, what does Sean Spicer think of what's going on now? Well, it's a good thing because he's coming up soon.